that this Assembly welcomes the important intervention of disability campaigner Heidi Crowder and rejects the imposition of abortion legislation which extends to all non-fatal disabilities, including Down syndrome. Members, this clearly is a highly emotive subject area. I would ask members to recognise that and be measured and sensitive in their language. I call Joanne Bunting to move the motion. I beg to move, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposal of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published in the Marshal's list. I now invite you to open the debate. I call Ms Bunning. Thank you. This is the first debate we've had in the Assembly since our law on abortion was changed. I'm not intending that the debate should be a discussion of how we got here, although in passing it must be noted that we've been subjected to constitutional indignities that I could never have imagined a year ago. Neither Wales nor Scotland would ever countenance being subject to the extraordinary denial of constitutional due process that has been meted out towards Northern Ireland on this issue. There are occasions in life, not very often, but sometimes, when we get to meet someone who is truly inspirational, someone whose passion and vision changes the way in which we see the world. This is the case when you meet Heidi Crowder, the young woman whose name is in the motion before our house today. Heidi's 24 and she has Down syndrome. She works in a children's hair salon and next month on Independence Day, the 4th of July, she will marry her fiance, James Carter, who also has Down syndrome and who Heidi describes as gorgeous. This lady is a joy and brings joy. When you leave a conversation with Heidi, you leave with your heart full. Heidi Crowder is an extraordinary human being. Since February, she's been in the news because she is challenging the current law in England and Wales, which allows abortion up to birth in cases of disabilities, but not in other circumstances. Heidi describes the current law in Great Britain as offensive and hurtful. Why would we countenance in 2020 the disability discrimination that the Westminster Parliament was persuaded to vote for 30 years ago in 1990, before the advent of disability discrimination legislation and before the UK became a signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? We cannot and must not separate the regulations from the people to whom they would apply. The reason why the general upper limit for abortion in Great Britain was set at 24 weeks in 1990 is because then 24 weeks was regarded as the point of viability, that is, the point at which a baby could survive outside the womb. Today, things have advanced, and well over 50% of babies born at 24 weeks now survive, and as gestation progresses, the figure becomes much higher. Notwithstanding this fact, Regulation 7.1b of the abortion regulations allows abortion up to birth in circumstances when, if the child were born, it would suffer from such physical or mental impairment as to be seriously disabled. In England and Wales, we know from abortion statistics that abortions on the ground of cleft palate, cleft lip and club foot, all conditions that can be addressed through surgery, are deemed to meet the threshold of seriously disabled and do happen. The problem with this, as Heidi and other disabled people point out, is simple. It means clearly saying that viable human beings with non-fatal disabilities and conditions like Down syndrome are worthy of less protection under the law than viable human beings who are deemed to be able-bodied. And this in turn clearly says that people with Down syndrome or other disabilities are of less value than people without disabilities. This is completely unacceptable in 2020. If we do not uphold this motion, we are signaling to every person with a disability that their life is valued differently to others. It is wholly wrong for these discriminatory provisions to have been forced upon us. In the last 30 years since 1990, Northern Ireland, like every jurisdiction in the UK, 
has introduced legal protections for individuals with disabilities. These laws seek to illustrate that those with disabilities are equal to everyone else. The Disability Discrimination Act 95 protects the rights of persons with disabilities. The Northern Ireland Act 98 placed a statutory duty on public authorities to have due regard to the need to promote equality of opportunity for persons with a disability. In 2006, the Disability Discrimination Northern Ireland Order further amended the DDA, including a requirement that public authorities promote positive attitudes towards disabled persons. In 2009, the UK as a whole ratified the UN CRPD. These laws are just laws. They reflect the fact that each and every person, regardless of ability or disability, is of value and worth. Do we wish to negate all this progress? Given the changes in the last 30 years, it is astonishing that the UK government should give Northern Ireland the 1990 legislation in 2020. There has been no attempt to consider whether this legislation is suitable in a 2020 Northern Ireland context. The only concession to bringing the provision up to date is to change the language from seriously handicapped to seriously disabled. Isn't seriously disabled quite a high threshold? The threshold seriously disabled in Regulation 7 has exactly the same meaning as seriously handicapped in the 1967 Act. Ironically, the change from handicapped to disabled simply reflects the fact that the word handicapped is now rightly rejected as pejorative by disabled people, missing the more basic point that if one wants to update the law to reflect changing attitudes to disability, the more appropriate way of doing this would be not to allow abortion on this basis at all. It is extremely disturbing that the government has chosen to ignore the views of the UNCRPD in its latest report on the UK, which stated, the committee is concerned about perceptions in society that stigmatise persons with disabilities and about the termination of pregnancy at any stage on the basis of fetal impairment. The committee recommends that the UK amend its abortion law accordingly without legalising selective abortion on the grounds of fetal deficiency. Nor has the UK government acknowledged the views of the Supreme Court, which has considered the issue of whether under the European Convention there is a human right to abortion in cases of non-fatal disability. The court, albeit in a non-binding judgment, found that no such right exists. Indeed, Lord Kerr in his remarks stated, UNCRPD is based on the premise that if abortion is permissible, there should be no discrimination on the basis that the fetus, because of a defect, will result in a child being born with a physical or mental disability. He also said, many children born with disabilities, even grave disabilities, lead happy, fulfilled lives. In many instances, they enrich and bring joy to their families and those who come into contact with them. I think everyone in this assembly would agree with this assessment. In truth, the UK government's explanatory memorandum makes it plain that rather than being guided by the CEDAW report, which actually suggests far more modest changes to Northern Ireland's abortion laws than those in the regulations, its guiding concern is to make sure that any abortion a woman can have in England can also be had in Northern Ireland. That's why, for all the talk about 12 weeks, the regulations actually allow abortion up to 24 weeks on effectively the same grounds as apply in England and up until birth in cases of disability. Neither of these provisions is required by CEDAW. Lord Shinkwin, who is seriously disabled, introduced the Abortion Disability Equality Act Bill in the 2016-17 session of the Westminster Parliament. He said, I utterly reject this medical mindset that clings to the idea that a disabled baby is a medical failure to be eradicated through abortion. I beg no one for my equality. I know I have as much right as anyone to be alive. The Charity Disability Rights UK, commenting on Lord Shinkwin's bill, said, fundamentally, it is about equality. Wherever Parliament sets the number of weeks after which abortion is not permitted, it should be exactly the same, whether the pregnancy is likely to result in a disabled or a non-disabled child. All lives are equal. In closing, let's be crystal clear about what voting for this motion means. You'll be voting to say that Northern Ireland rejects abortion law which directly discriminates against a human being purely on the basis of disability. 
only this group of viable humans can be aborted up to term. You will be saying that this assembly does not agree that it is right that unborn children with Down syndrome or cleft palate can be aborted just because they have those conditions. You will be voting to reject the imposition of abortion legislation on Northern Ireland. Abortion law is a devolved matter and we are responsible for reflecting our society's values in this area, not Great Britain. You will be voting for life. I shall leave you with the words of Heidi Crowder. It makes me feel as though I shouldn't exist in the world. Is that the message this House and we as individuals want to send to our disabled community? Is this who we are? Heidi said, my life has as much value as anyone else's. I am asking all MLAs to reject Westminster's regulations. Please don't vote for more discrimination against people like me. Please let Northern Ireland continue to be a country where disabled people are valued. I implore you to support this motion. And I call Emma Sheeran to move the amendment. William Bogri, let the hall I'd like to move, please. Thank you. And the uh, mem person proposing the amendment will have 10 minutes to propose it and a further five minutes to wind. All other speakers in this debate will have five minutes. And I invite you to move the amendment. The DUP motion today is an attempt to undermine any and all abortion provision in the North. We in Sinn Féin oppose the DUP's attack on women's reproductive rights and we oppose the DUP's attempt to undermine our right to modern health care. The amendment that we have put forward would see a refining of the law to offer abortion services in the North merged with the services that we already have in the 26 counties. Sinn Féin is not just a parliamentary party. We are a political movement and we decide policy as a collective with membership having a say on every single decision. This is democracy, and it's one of the things that first inspired me when I joined Sinn Féin. It's the political activism that I've been involved in as a member that I'm most proud of. Sinn Féin activists, and this has been well documented, have been on the ground delivering food parcels to those most in need over the course of the coronavirus pandemic, something made possible in most instances by my comrade, Minister Deirdre Hargey who's been a fantastic advocate for communities since she took on her role in the executive team just six short months ago. In the midst of this health crisis, we've been involved in our respective communities on the local initiatives, from litter picks to sponsored walks, demonstrating leadership and lifting spirits in what's been a tough time for everyone. We continue to drive the little things that make big improvements in the places that we call home. That's what we do, it's activism. When the Eighth Amendment was repealed in the South just over two years ago, Sinn Féin activists were at the heart of the campaign. The movement who drove repeal were a broad church, and Sinn Féin members took their place and organised just as we would on any other campaign for social justice. Abortion is an incredibly sensitive topic and something that has divided Irish society and indeed societies across the world for a long time. Many are uncomfortable with this issue. And only after years of dialogue and a willingness to understand the hurt and pain dealt with by generations of Irish women in crisis situations did we see the conditions whereby over 66% of voters in the 26 counties chose to repeal the Eighth Amendment from the Irish Constitution. This tells us that the public understands the need for safe and compassionate abortion services for women. Following on from this, our members in the Oireachtas Committee supported the recommendations of the clinicians and implemented the current abortion legislation in the 26. Sinn Féin supports abortion in instances of fatal fetal abnormalities for victims of sexual crime and for anyone whose life or health, including their mental health, is in danger. Our party policy states that any gestational time limit should be set according to the advice of medical practitioners, which is what guided the legislation in the 26 counties. Sinn Féin's amendment today is merely an expression of this party policy. I myself canvassed in the lead up to the referendum in Cavan and Monaghan and Donegal, and I spoke to people on doorsteps about how they would be voting. Indeed, since the change to our own party policy at an Ardesh preceding the referendum, I've had many conversations with voters with former voters and with potential voters about the issue of abortion. 
As a representative from a political party, I have been lobbied by and engaged with people on all sides of this argument. This is an incredibly sensitive and emotive topic, and none of us know what any other person has lived through or the experiences that they have had that have shaped the position that they hold. To simply dismiss people who are uncomfortable with the legalisation of termination as backwards or regressive is not helpful. This debate requires sensitivity, empathy and respect. Ultimately, it is about health care. The past is shameful enough and it must be left in the past. Generations of pregnant Irish women and girls were treated with disdain for the crime of being pregnant, shunned even in their own homes, villages and towns. We've seen young girls abandoned by their families and sent away to Magdalen laundries in a whirlwind of secrecy and shame. Mass graves containing the remains of unnamed babies demonstrate the regard in which life was held by some within the church. Women who could afford to were exploited by illegal abortionists in back street rooms masquerading as clinics, and a blind eye was turned to their plight so as to not upset appearances. There isn't a family in Ireland that this hasn't touched, and it's only when a person finds themselves in a position of desperation that they know what they would do. That people in crisis situations are still not able to receive treatment at home here is not good enough. We in Sinn Féin would have liked to see abortion services delivered across Ireland by legislators here in Ireland. For us not to have been able to do that is a shame, but when a right is delayed, it is denied. And it's for this reason that we supported the regulations that came into force in the North at the end of March. We welcomed the decriminalisation of women, something that punished people in already difficult circumstances, adding untold trauma to the lives of thousands of women who lived in fear of being found out for what they had done. I have written to the Minister for Health asking that the regulations, as set out by the British Government, are implemented and properly funded by the Department of Health locally, so as to see a fully commissioned service across all five healthcare trusts here. The Health Minister has abdicated his responsibilities in this issue, failing to give clear direction to the health trusts which adheres to the law. This leaves women in limbo. Sinn Féin want to see an end to this. We want to see a proper, safe, legal service for anyone in crisis, whatever their story. We also acknowledge the work of disability campaigners such as Heidi Crowder. Sinn Féin want to see a fair and just society. We want to see an end to all injustices, both in terms of deliberate, state-led, institutionalised discrimination, the kind of which that has been talked about at the minute worldwide, as well as the societal prejudices that are held by people who think that they're doing nothing wrong. It's only when this is called out that the legitimisation of such views is halted, and Sinn Féin will continue to do that. I will. Before she finishes her party political broadcast, I might a reminder that this, this isn't all about Sinn Féin. Would you have time to give any thought to the rights of the innocent in the womb who are denied the most basic right of all, the right to live? Is there any thought for them? I thank the member for his comment. I'm a Sinn Féin representative, and as, as thus I will speak for Sinn Féin. To serve disabled people properly, we need to build infrastructure which is totally accessible. We need to have inclusivity to properly service Section 75 obligations across all public sector bodies and to raise awareness of the issues that face less able people in their daily lives. Sinn Féin do not believe that a non-fatal fetal abnormality is an appropriate criteria for an abortion. Our party position, mandated by our party membership, has a modern and compassionate approach to health care at its core, and that is why we are opposed to the DUP motion here this evening. We do not support the DUP's cynical attempt to attack the entire body of human rights compliant health care for women. We are not in favour of blocking the ability of people in crisis to make the decision which they feel is best for them just because other people are uncomfortable with it. Their motion would undermine the regulations in totality, by stealth, and Sinn Féin is completely opposed to this. This is 2020, and women here must be afforded modern health care in this area as a right. There can be no further delays. We have waited long enough. Gora Maigat, I would urge people to support the amendment. Before I call the next speaker, 
I would like to remind members that the Business Committee has determined that this is a time-limited debate and set the limit of time for the debate. Clearly, there is considerable interest in this debate, but clearly, as a result of the guidance that has been given to me, I will not be able to call everyone. In accordance with Standing Order 17.4, the Business Committee has agreed a format for members to be called to speak that reflects party balance. But further to this, chairs can use some discretion when determining who to call. However, in doing so, chairs must have due regard not only to the balance of opinion and the number of members who have indicated and desired to speak, but party strengths. Members, I would ask you all to be realistic uh, about how often you can be expected to be called. I cannot call everyone who wishes to be called. I now call Dolores Kelly. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome uh, the opportunity to speak on this motion. It provides me and many of my party colleagues who do have a free vote and aren't excluded from their party should they differ from the party line to give voice to and reflect the sincerely held views of the many thousands of constituents who are opposed to abortion and the current legislative proposals by the British Government. I recognise the absolute responsibility on all speakers to ensure that their contributions are respectful of the opposing views of others. This debate is a very emotive one, made more powerful by the intervention of a young lady Heidi Crowder, who has Down syndrome. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to speak to her via Zoom and her mother Liz last night. She shared with us her plans for her wedding, which is due to be held next week, but the celebrations may ha for her wedding may have to be postponed due to the current COVID-19 restrictions. She has very sensibly alternative plans in place. And I'm sure that you will join with me in wishing her and her fiancé, James, a long and happy life together. This debate provides the opportunity to send a strong message to those in Westminster who seek to put in place regulations in Northern Ireland which would offer no gestational limits for children with disabilities. What does that say about the value placed on the life of a person born with a disability? It is almost beyond belief that abortion would be allowed up to full term. The amendment at Westminster which has given rise to this debate was inappropriately attached to a technical bill dealing with the postponement of assembly elections here. Many argued that the amendment was clearly outside the scope of the bill and all MPs from Northern Ireland in attendance voted against it. People here were prevented from having their say on the abortion regulations. Indeed, some would argue, including my good friend and former member of this House, Alban McGuinness, who has pointed out that this intervention weakens devolution and the responsibility of this Assembly to address our own social and economic problems, no matter how intractable they are. This is one of the reasons why I can't support the Sinn Féin amendment as I fail to understand why a so-called Republican Party supports a British government on determining the right to life of unborn Irish children. It's a long way from the proclamation of 1916, which promised to cherish all the children of the nation equally. My colleague Justin McNulty argues that by removing the words, rejects the imposition of abortion legislation, Sinn Féin's amendment gives cover to an overreaching British government that chose to override the democratic wishes of people in this part of Ireland. Therefore, I cannot support this amendment for this and other reasons. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am very conscious of the public interest in this debate and the arguments from both sides, but especially people with disabilities living within our families and communities. I acknowledge that very many people with a disability live independently and have rich and fulfilling lives. But that is not the reality for all. Therefore, as a society, it is not enough for us to pay lip service to families and carers struggling to cope with their caring responsibilities. 
we must invest in support and respite services to enable individuals to live as fulfilling a life as possible. Diversity and inclusion should be celebrated. I support the motion as tabled and want to conclude by referring to Heidi, whose hashtag is amazing just the way we are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Speaker. I call Rosemary Barton. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I take part in this debate this afternoon with a sense of bewilderment and irony. Over these past three months in the country, has listened to accounts of individuals striving to, li- striving to live, and our medical profession have been doing all in their power in the face of COVID to save lives. Yet, we are here to reject discriminatory abortion legislation, which extends to all non-fatal disabilities. As a result of both Houses of Parliament supporting a change in the law on abortion in Northern Ireland and ignoring the rights of the unborn child, one finds oneself having to defend those rights, the rights of the baby in the womb. Debating the imposition of abortion legislation which treats children in the womb with non-fatal disability differently from those who do not have a disability. Is this not discrimination? Everyone has a right to life, disabled or non-disabled, must be treated with equal and valued equally. All life is sacred. There is not one of us in this chamber that is perfect. We are either too tall, too short, too small or too large. The list is endless. Yet, because of this new legislation, the helpless in the womb, because of their imperfections, such as a cleft palate, a club foot or Down syndrome, may have their lives terminated on the basis of non-fatal impairment. How diabolical! Last year, I had the pleasure of being invited by a young Down syndrome man to go and watch him participate in his qualifying rounds for the Special Olympics football team. What a joy it was for both his parents and myself. How wonderful to see him taking part in a team sport, passing the ball, listening to the pep talk at half term, at half time, and going to score, going on to score the winning goal. How proud were his parents, like the other parents who had come to stand on the sidelines and encourage and cheer on their sons. That same young man had been away from his parents for a week, training for his matches, yes, leading a life in many ways similar to those of our household names who represent their countries at different sporting events. When not playing sport, he was helping out in the family farm. Who cannot say that this young man was not leading a fulfilling, independent life? How could this young person be denied this opportunity? Yet another young lady I know, who also has Down syndrome, she leads a full and busy life, helping in a kitchen of her local school, preparing and serving lunches, the very school where she was once a pupil. Both these young people are evidence of how their individual roles in society no matter how minor or major their limitations are, how important they are. Think of how much they have enriched the lives of their parents, siblings and wider family, and also how much society has learned and gained from them. Yes, having a disabled baby may be a challenge, but who has not been challenged by a baby? Be it restless at night due to colic, are just not wanting to sleep. How many, of us, how many of us are not challenged by our children and their behaviour, whether they are able-bodied or not? Before concluding, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe it's also important to make this point that we've also got to remember, remember those health workers who work with these people and they may have an issue of conscience with this law. Finally, 
It is important to remember that one cannot tolerate and promote disabled babies having less protection in the law than babies who are not disabled. All humans should be valued and protected equally. I therefore welcome the intervention of disability campaigner Heidi Crowther and support the motion. I call Paula Bradshaw. I'm going to be speaking in this um, debate in a personal capacity as abortion is a matter of conscience for members of the Alliance Party. I will not be supporting the motion nor the amendment. On Thursday evenings, we all go out at 8pm to clap for our medical workforce as we value their clinical credentials, their professional judgment and the care and compassion they show to COVID-19 patients. Yet what this motion and amendment suggests is that we aren't to value their clinical credentials, their professional judgment and the care and compassion they show to pregnant women on a Friday morning. I trust our registered medical professionals and I also trust women. By week 20, when we get the big scan and women have thought of names and chosen the prams, etc., to receive important news about complexities with your pregnancy would floor any one of us. So if any MLA in this chamber thinks that a woman would make a choice to terminate a late pregnancy without days of completely fretting and agonising through every aspect of the rest of the pregnancy and beyond, then they, in my opinion, are viewing these women with disrespect and a lack of empathy. I believe that the DUP, in bringing this non-binding motion, and then Sinn Féin in proposing the amendment are pay, playing politics by trying to imply that any MLA who does not support them does not care about children born with a disability. Nothing could be further from the truth. This motion refers to those who live with Down syndrome. My aunt Margaret, who's now sadly passed, she lived with Down syndrome. She passed in her 50s and she was a very much loved and central member of my mother's family circle. So if my daughter, for example, came to me with such a diagnosis during my pregnancy, of course I would support her. However, these regulations are not about me and my family. They are about the unknown women out there whose personal circumstances I do not know anything about. These regulations are not about compelling a woman to terminate a pregnancy. They are about providing this healthcare option within our country. When the Northern Ireland office engaged with political parties and other stakeholders last year, they made it clear that they were looking at abortion laws and regulations across the UK, Ireland and Western Europe in order to learn from their experiences. I have no doubt, therefore, that the NIO officials considered the Health Act 2018 in the Republic of Ireland that restricts fatal anomaly-related abortions to only those deemed fatal. However, this means that medical professionals do not feel comfortable with such ambiguous terminology in the regulations, and so women from the South have had to continue to travel to England to access their health care. This Act in the South is not preventing the abortion, they are just continuing to export the problem. As a legislator in this Assembly, I would hate to see any woman forced to make such a lonely and heartbreaking journey. Turning specifically to the regulations, in sections three to seven, they spell out very clearly the grounds for abortion, with particular reference to the role of the two registered medical professionals. When the health minister has been asked about how this works in practice through assembly written questions, he has replied, my department has made it clear to medical professionals that abortion is now legal and they should assess on a case by case basis whether a woman's circumstances meet the grounds for a termination of pregnancy. This would include a surgical abortion where this is deemed clinically necessary. He didn't use the word desirable nor capricious, but clinically necessary. For the professional accountability mechanisms, they are built into the regulations, giving the General Medical Council and the Nursing and Midwifery Council power to investigate whether the fitness to practice of a reg registered medical professional is impaired. And then the governance and transparency mechanisms are also built in with the requirement of the registered medical professionals to report every termination to the Chief Medical Officer. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, the truth is that procuring an abortion is never an easy decision for a woman, whether it is a crisis pregnancy for which she seeks an early medical abortion, 
or where she receives news of a severe fatal impairment or a fatal fatal abnormality. And as a compassionate society, we must do all we can to support her, not judge nor vilify her. Thank you. Can I encourage members to be concise in their contributions? They don't have to take their full five minutes. It may assist me to get another speaker in. And I call Jonathan Buckley. Today I stand in the House to speak upon an issue which I believe is one of the most crucial of our lifetime, the sanctity of life. An issue which transcends traditional political and community lines and an issue which was cruelly taken from us and exploited by English MPs at a time of Westminster political chaos. From I took my place in this House, I have always sought to fight for the defenceless, the weak and the innocent. Surely others in this House have been moved by the incredible crusade of Heidi Crowder, a young lady with Down syndrome who is determined to fight for justice and equality. Heidi's story, as moving as it is, does not stand in isolation. Many homes in Northern Ireland are filled with laughter, joy and happiness by those born with disabilities. Who are these disabled people? They are brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles, nieces and nephews, children and grandchildren. They are real people. Who are we to say that their life is worth less? I stand saddened and bewildered at a time when communities and governments and the field of medicine around the world have been mobilised to save the lives of the most vulnerable in our society. That here we are today in this House debating an issue which, if left unopposed, would strip those innocent pre-born babies of the most basic right of all, the right to life. Regulation 7 is a very transparent expression of discrimination. It means giving non-disabled viable babies in the womb greater legal protection than disabled viable babies in the womb. That would, of course, be discriminatory. The legal difference of treatment we are talking about here is immense, meaning that on the one hand, the life is protected, while on the other, far from being protected, the state will happily acquiesce with the termination of viable, disabled human beings. This is no ordinary discrimination. This is fatal discrimination. Is it any wonder that Heidi Crowder has said that as a lady with Down syndrome, the law makes her sad and cry? It would make me sad and cry if I had Down syndrome. And to be honest with you, it makes me sad and cry even though I do not. I salute Heidi and her boldness in going to the courts to try and get this discriminatory law struck down. I want this assembly to compassionately respond and say, not in our name. I do not believe that any part of the United Kingdom has ever been subject to worse constitutional abuses in modern times than Northern Ireland has in the development of these abortion regulations. Regardless of what we may or may not think of their content. No self-respecting member of this House should accept them because of the way in which they have been developed. Abortion is a devolved matter. The amendment which sought to change Northern Ireland's abortion laws in spite of this was, according to the Commons clerk, out of scope and only got through because of the pressure of a large number of signatories by MPs from outside Northern Ireland. Absolutely, yes. Does the member agree with me that that was an abuse of both parliamentary and the constitutional norms? Absolutely, and it is for these very reasons that these regulations cannot be cherry-picked. That is why we cannot support the Sinn Féin amendment today. They rise together or fall together. Let us look at actually what happened. Northern Ireland MPs were ignored on what was a Northern Ireland only issue. A 17-minute debate on a matter of life and death and an NIO consultation overwhelmingly opposed by 79% of submissions. The essence of constitutional democracy is not simply majoritarianism, but majoritarianism subject to rules. 
as long as these abortion regulations exist. They openly mock the people of Northern Ireland and their right to the dignity of constitutional due process. The litany of constitutional offences that informed the way Westminster and Whitehall handled this issue since last July are now massively compounded by the fact that despite a restoration of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Her Majesty's Government is instead proposing to ask Westminster to vote to pass legislation on a devolved matter. We must call on the Government to respect devolution, to abandon these regulations and to repeal Section 9. Mr Speaker, in closing, quite simply, the lives of our unborn depend upon it. Thank you. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, this motion brought forward today by the DUP is a transparent attempt to undermine the progress made to date and deny women reproductive rights. The legislative framework on abortion in the North prior to last October failed women. Based on archaic legislation from 1861, it criminalised those accessing abortion and forced people to travel for health care or access medication, access medication online with the fear of prosecution if anything went wrong. It disproportionately impacted on those from poor socioeconomic backgrounds and caused additional stress and trauma to so many people. Like many others, I campaigned for the repeal of the Eighth Amendment and for the long overdue change in the law here in the North. The fact that Westminster had to bring forward the legislation is regrettable, but it was necessary because of the failure of the DUP and others to uphold human rights obligations. My preference and that of my party would have been for this Assembly to bring forward the legislation for those we represent. However, we now have the legislative framework that entitles women to access abortion services, and the Health Minister should implement the regulations and commission these services as a matter of urgency. I commend all those who campaigned for many years to bring about this change, and those who continue to campaign for the right of women to access modern and compassionate health care. We should not conflate issues in what is already an emotive de debate for many people. We must, of course, and I doubt there is anyone here who does not, but we must, of course, support and campaign for the rights of persons with disabilities and for proper access to the support and services for all those with additional needs. We must support those who choose to continue with a pregnancy with a diagnosis of fetal abnormality and put in place adequate perinatal health care services. However, we must also not stigmatise any individual who makes a difficult decision to terminate a pregnancy. Whatever one's personal view on this issue, as legislators we have a duty to ensure there is provision of modern health care for all citizens, including local access to abortion services. I call Pam Cameron. Deputy Speaker, what kind of society do we want to live in? I believe that's a fundamental question. My own view is that how we treat and how we shape society for those with disabilities goes a long way to determining the answer. At the heart of the matter before us today is this question. Are those with a disability an equal citizen? Is the remarkable, inspiring Heidi Crowder an equal citizen to every MLA in this House? Mr Deputy Speaker, the stance this House takes on Regulation 71B and the Regulation 13 on Abortion in Northern Ireland regulations is a test for all of us who believe in equality. In a genuinely humane society, it would be entirely wrong to allow the termination of any viable human being, whether they have a disability or not. What is particularly appalling about this legislation from a disability perspective is that it compounds that offence by saying that it would be wrong to terminate another viable human being of exactly the same age because they don't have Down syndrome or another non-fatal disability. This sends out a message, loud and clear, that human beings with Down syndrome or other non-fatal disabilities are worthy of less protection in law because they are less worthwhile, less valuable. This is the ethic of a eugenic society that I, for one, have no desire to be a part of. In England and Wales, in cases where women receive a diagnosis before birth that their child has Down syndrome, the abortion rate between 20 and 2017 was a staggering 85.1 per cent. 
I've been disturbed by some of the arguments that have been advanced in favour of allowing abortion on the diagnosis of Down syndrome from the point of viability to birth. And those arguing refuse to engage with the fact that we are talking about a viable human being and just focus on what they say is the right of the woman to abort in these circumstances. There is sometimes an attempt to give legitimacy to the notion that we should sanction disability discrimination in abortion legislation because of the health of the mother. This, however, simply won't do. If one prohibits disability discriminatory abortion, it does not change the fact that it is still legal to abort up until birth if the life of the mother is in danger. This has always been legal in Northern Ireland. Although clearly, if it is possible to save the mother's life by removing the child in a way that keeps the child alive as well, then this must be striven for. Others have simply tried to change the subject, saying, why don't they focus more on providing support for our mothers and children with non-fatal disabilities? Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to address the amendment in the name of the Sinn Féin MLAs. Firstly, I am pleased that Sinn Féin are clear that they cannot support abortion on the basis of non-fatal disability up till birth, but their amendment falls short, as it fails to acknowledge the concerns with other aspects of the regulations and the constitutional violation against the devolved settlement by imposing Westminster rule on the people of Northern Ireland in this area. I personally don't believe that any self-respecting person in Northern Ireland should accept these regulations because of the extraordinary manner in which they have been developed. Moreover, devolution has now been restored. We are quite capable of developing our own legislation. Rather than asking Westminster Parliament to vote for regulations, the next step the UK Government should take is to ask Westminster to recognise that devolution has now been restored for nearly five months and it is time for them to repeal Section 9, which has now been overtaken by events. As the mover of the amendment that became Section 9 said at the time, and I quote, if it was not for the fact that we do not have an assembly, this would absolutely not be the right way forward, but we do not have an assembly and will not have one any time soon. And that statement was made on the 9th of July 2019. Well, now we do have an assembly. And Westminster has still not voted on a new abortion law for Northern Ireland. And so now, absolutely, is not the right time for such a vote. The government should instead ask Parliament to recognise the restoration of the assembly by repealing Section 9 and let us get on with the business of defining our own abortion law to take place um, of the Act of 1861. Thank you. I call Colin Gildenew. Let me start by stating that I am opposed to this motion, as it is clearly aimed at rolling back elements of progress for women in our society to be treated with respect and compassion in relation to their rights and in terms of access to appropriate medical care, and I wish to speak in support of the amendment. Abortion is a sensitive and emotive issue for many people, but change is clearly needed. Before being repealed on the 22nd of October, women who found themselves in the difficult position of seeking an abortion were criminalised under sections 58 and 59 of Westminster's Offences Against the Person Act. In order to access abortion services, women had to either travel overseas, delaying the termination and adding expense and stress, or purchase abortion pills without proper medical advice and supervision. We cannot leave women to deal with these situations without support and appropriate health care, nor can we simply continue to turn a blind eye to the plight of those who are struggling with issues arising from rape and fatal, fatal abnormality. There are no perfect or easy solutions here, but we must do our utmost to address these issues as legislators as best we can. The Health Committee here have written to the Minister for Health to urge him to provide appropriate abortion services to women, particularly in light of the additional complications which have arisen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. He has a duty to ensure services are provided at this time in a safe and accessible way. Sinn Féin's preference was for the Assembly to introduce legislation on safe and compassionate abortion services in the north of Ireland so that women on the entire island would have the services they deserve. In the South, legislation was developed following detailed consideration and discussion via a Citizens' Assembly and was ratified strongly by those who live in the 26 counties via referendum. We in Sinn Féin believe that abortion should be available where a woman's life, health or mental health is at risk, in cases of fatal, fatal abnormality and in cases of rape or sexual abuse. 
Sinn Féin believe that abortion without specific indication should be available through a GP-led service in a clinical context as determined by law and licensed in practice for a limited gestational period. We support the Joint Directors Committee finding that it is not possible to legislate for abortion in the case of rape in a compassionate way. This is reflected in a new legal framework for abortion services here, that such a provision is proportionate and appropriate in order to avoid building a system that could lead to further trauma for victims of rape or incest, or act as a barrier to access for victims of sexual crime. However, Sinn Féin does not support CEDAW's recommendations to provide abortion in the case of severe fetal impairment, such as Down syndrome. Our amendment welcomes the important intervention of disability campaigner Heidi Crowder, who has been referred to today, and rejects the specific legislative provision in the abortion legislation which goes beyond fatal fetal abnormalities to include non-fatal disabilities, including Down syndrome. I support the amendment. I call Matthew Tull. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak um, extremely briefly on this um, motion and the amendment. Um, the first thing I want to say is that um, this is an extraordinarily difficult and complicated subject. It is sometimes easy to um, portray this as a completely black and white question, but it isn't. As multiple speakers have mentioned, abortion is an extraordinarily sensitive subject. It um, divides people and families. It can divide people of goodwill who are uh, in an honest and ethical disagreement about this, these very profound issues. My own party, um, uh, as my colleague Dolores Kelly outlined, uh, enables a conscience vote on this issue, recognising it is extraordinarily sensitive. Uh, so I want to say very clearly before I move on to the substance of the motion and the amendment that I believe that it is possible for people of goodwill, moral and ethical people to take different views on this subject. To move on to the substance of the motion, I will not be supporting uh, the DUP motion uh, this evening. Um, I said a few weeks ago in this chamber that I believed it was a positive step forward in terms of health care for women in Northern Ireland. That provision had been made to, um, uh, in a sense, bring us closer to where the rest of the UK and indeed the rest of Ireland was in terms of provision for this, uh, uh, this health care need for women. Key for me in coming to this decision, this practical decision as a legislator, which I am now, and thinking through the moral and ethical implications of all this is not um, what I believe is a, a kind of catch-all position for, for, for everyone. It's whether it's my job as a legislator to um, limit the options available to women in extraordinary distress. And while I may have reservations about specific instances and specific issues, it really isn't for me. Um, in every circumstance to say to women in extreme distress that they can't access um, health care. Um, I find it um, difficult to hear um, uh, testimony from people um, with disabilities who feel that, um, who, feel, you know, who have expressed views on this. You know, none of us, I think, can pretend this, uh, this stuff is easy. There are a range of views from people within um, the disabled community. It is also true that um, there are a range of other ways in which we as a society and as a state can do better by um, disabled people. I want to say, um, as others have said, that in no way is my view on, my, or my views on abortion care in any way um, uh, a reflection of my views of the values of, uh, of, of disabled people. Um, so I won't be um, supporting the motion, which I believe would um, start to um, take us back in terms of, of abortion care in, in Northern Ireland. I will also say that I do think it's legitimate that this motion is debated. I don't have a, I'm, I'm, I don't think people shouldn't be able to debate this in the Northern Ireland Assembly. I've, in the previous item, I've been talking about the importance of the Northern Ireland Assembly making its voice heard. I completely accept that, and there will be many people in this chamber, and including in my party, who take a different view than me. We're here now, and I respect your right to make your 
voice heard on this. So I will not be supporting the DEP motion, uh, and I won't be supporting um, the Sinn Féin uh, amendment in part because I'm not entirely clear what's, what it's intended to do, and uh, I also think that it would contribute to a, um, a, a whittling away of, um, of, of rights. Uh, but having said that, it is important that people are able to debate these issues, and I respect that we are able to debate them here tonight in the Assembly. So I hope we can continue to proceed with this debate in as respectful a way as possible. Uh, and I will conclude my remarks at that, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise uh, as a matter of conscience, Phil Stewart Unionist Party, and uh, speak on behalf of myself. Today's motion, uh, to me, is not about the rights and wrongs of uh, abortion. If it were, I fear we would be simply rehearsing very old and long-held positions that in many ways have paved the way for the Westminster Government and the NIO um, uh, to dream up such extreme and discriminatory measures. To disregard the vast majority of consultation responses and on the proposed uh, legislation and regulations. In my mind, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, what these motions are actually about is our attitude to equality and disability. And I would go much further and say that almost all of us here in this chamber today are engaged in politics because we are fueled by a desire for justice, for equality and for humanity. And sometimes that narrative does get blurred, dependent on the setting of the story, but not Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, in this case, when elected to the Assembly in 2016, I established two new passions. One of them, everyone in this House will know, is that of mental health. The other, and born out of my active membership in the relevant all-party groups, uh, was learning disability and disability. And I've learned many things participating in these forums. However, perhaps the overriding theme that is common to these APGs is that of stigmatisation, discrimination, and the ongoing battle for equality. And I cannot overstate the conversations that I have been involved in with the stakeholders of these groups that demonstrate the real difficulties and barriers that people with a disability or a learning disability still face here in Northern Ireland in 2020. I have enjoyed every moment of learning more about disability and learning disability and having challenged my own perceptions and myths of what a normal life can be, what, a fulfillment, what life of fulfilment could be and what actually really matters. And a number of years ago, at an event with Mencap in the Long Gallery, um, I had the absolute privilege of holding and nursing a two-year-old boy. His mum handed them to me, and I'm not going to exaggerate when I say that as he smiled into my face, I absolutely fell in love with him. I'm not using his name here because I don't have the permission uh, from his mum. But at that time, I can tell you, that young man who has Down syndrome left an indelible mark on my heart. In Lisburn, we are very proud of the work done by Stepping Stones. Since 1996, the team have striven with great passion and determination to offer support and value to people with learning difficulties and, uh, and learning disabilities. And all of the trainees uh, who have a learning difficulty, many of them men and women uh, with Down syndrome. Recently, I called with their CEO uh, at their new premises, which is Avenue One, it's, uh, for a coffee and a snack. Uh, but what struck me was the reception that I got from the front of house waiter. Shown to my seat, order taken and advice given on what was evidently a menu that he had contributed to. This young man with Down syndrome showed me an attitude of hospitality and customer service sometimes missing in other settings. At Christmas time, I actually look forward uh, to going to get an invitation. We all do. We love to get those invitations to go to Carl service and nativity services. In addition, the ones that I look forward to most are the invites that come from Mencap from Parkview Special School in Lisburn. And to my great delight, two years ago, I got an invitation to Glenvay Special School Nativity Play. And even if you don't like Christmas, I suggest you seek out an opportunity to go to one of these uh, nativity scenes. There can be no suggestion that for many of these individuals and very special children, life can be a challenge. And for some, quite difficult. But to see the joy, the concentration, the effort, the professionalism, often the mischievousness, on their faces and their actions can only reaffirm, if required, that every life is precious and that we must do all we can to empower, support and demonstrate to those children, those pupils, that they are valued every bit as much as we value ourselves. There are a number of disability champions that are worthy of mention. However, on and for the purpose of this debate today, there is only one that I will name, as many of you have done so far, and that is Heidi Crowder. Having spent 40 minutes on a Zoom call on Saturday morning with Heidi, Paul and Joanna and myself, I can safely say that I needed, if I needed any validation of supporting the motion today, 
I got it in spades. The sad reality, in fact, remains, though, that Heidi has to speak on an issue of legislation and regulation which seeks to devalue the person that she is. Yes, indeed. In that call that I was able to, to be on with, with Robbie, you'll agree with me that she really did speak to the heart and is a powerful advocate on this issue. The members have an extra minute, but I can ask members to speak towards the chair and ensure that the microphone picks up what they're saying. You have an extra minute. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you for the intervention. Indeed, as has been pointed out by Doris Kelly, uh, a moment spent talking to Heidi reaffirms the heart that there is, are champions out there who are working in, in, in really challenging circumstances. And as I've said, Heidi has Down syndrome, and she's speaking about a regulation which speaks about her. Um, put simply, the regulation 71B allows abortions for serious fetal impairment, where there is a substantial risk that if born the child and that's the word that's used in the regulation, the child, would suffer from such physical or mental impairment as to be seriously disabled. Imagine having, imagine having to have a face-to-face -face discussion with someone who was born with what in England and Wales is, for the purpose of abortion legislation, deemed a serious fetal impairment. That same person, Heidi, will soon be 24, and as we've heard, she's going to be married. She is a disability champion. She will soon marry her fiancé. Could any of you here today seriously sit face to face with Heidi and say you were not equal? Today we have an opportunity to set aside the wider to abortion debate and insist that this legislation is challenged and changed. Today I say to Heidi and to others who have Down syndrome and other non-fatal disabilities that even as an unborn baby you are equal, you are valued and that you are seen. Member's time is up. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Alliance Party policy on abortion is a matter of individual conscience. Uh, therefore, I, I speak in a personal capacity. I also said at the outset that I think it would enrich the debate, and I say that sincerely, um, if the DUP were able to speak to work of the Education Minister to help pupils with disabilities at this time. I have spoken on this serious matter of abortion in this Assembly on a number of occasions. I have done my best to engage with health professionals and families affected by it, and with widely different views on it. In February 2016, over four years ago, in part because of this engagement, I voted in favour of legislative reform proposed by our colleague Trevor Lunn, MLA, and Stuart Dixon, MLA for abortion on the grounds of fatal fetal abnormality. Legislative provision that the courts have since required of this jurisdiction. I acknowledge there are, however, many people who uh, support inclusion of severe fetal abnormality as grounds for abortion in legislation due to concern that its omission could limit access to termination in cases of fatal fetal abnormality, and I will do my best to engage with those concerns um, uh, in the duration of my role. There are, however, many people in this Assembly and in Northern Ireland who cannot support legislative provision for abortion on the grounds of serious disability. Indeed, the DUP and Sinn Féin appear to agree on this matter and somehow have transpired to disagree in the duration of this debate today, which appears to be a real missed opportunity. As far as I can see, the text of the DUP motion is rejection of abortion legislation, which extends to all non-fatal disabilities, uh, and the same provision is contained in the amendment. So I think it is a real shame and disappointment that some degree of agreement wasn't reached in that regard. I am not able to support legislative provision for abortion on what I believe are ill-defined grounds of severe fetal abnormality, particularly if this provides for abortion on the grounds of serious physical or mental disability. As I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, my assessment of the amendment and the motion is that someone who is unable to support abortion on the grounds of non-fatal disabilities ought to vote in favour of the amendment and the motion. They, as far as I can see, oppose abortion on the grounds of non-fatal disability, and I will therefore vote for the amendment and the motion on these grounds on this occasion. It must be acknowledged, however, that neither the amendment nor the motion do anything to change what is a legal duty on the UK Government to implement CEDAW recommendations on abortion, which include the grounds of severe fetal abnormality. I had hoped that the UK legislation would have accepted fatal fetal abnormality to have satisfied the CEDAW requirement, but that does not appear to be the case at this stage. 
It is also an inescapable fact that the UK abortion legislation exists because the Northern Ireland Executive didn't. I don't know if Northern Ireland legislation can amend this primary UK legislation, but if people are serious about delivering fit-for-purpose abortion legislation in Northern Ireland, then a three-year executive hiatus and private members' motions are not going to achieve it. I, Mr Deputy Speaker, will continue to do my best to engage respectfully, openly and inclusively on this serious matter of abortion legislation with anyone who gives me the opportunity to do so. Thank you. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I am one of very many who are very thankful for the Westminster MPs and Stella Creasy in particular for changing our laws. But instead of debating why we here in Northern Ireland are still without regulations, um, we're debating laws that we cannot change. So reducing an anomaly clause um, to only permitting fatal an anomalies can be shown, as in the example in the Republic of Ireland, to actually limit when even fatal diagnoses due to un unattainable certainty required. The motion and the amendment would compel medics to make impossible distinctions between fatal and non-fatal anom anomalies, limiting access to abortion health care. What this motion and amendment would do, if enforced, would mean that women and girls would be forced to continue to travel to England and beyond, just as they were before the legislation changed. A similar clause in the Irish Republic has resulted in women and girls whose pregnancies are diagnosed with severe and life-threatening anomalies continuing to travel overseas to access abortion, just like the law never changed. I am stunned at this uh, amendment from Sinn Féin. Um, I'm stunned at their forked tongue language. Their amendment would force women to continue to rely on health care in England, and that was not their election messages of equality for all and compassionate health care, because this is what a clawback of women's rights looks like. This is what political opportunism looks like, and this is what populism looks like. For the DUP to claim that it is morally unjustifiable to use a fetus as a political bargaining chip when the same DUP members write to their constituents and request a letter writing campaign to promote a change in legislation is ironic much. But at least the DUP are consistent in their disdain for women, for their bodies and their choices. This motion and amendment are not compliant with CEDAW and our law states that we need to be. The CEDAW report recommends that abortion on the grounds of severe fetal impairment be available to facilitate reproductive choice and autonomy. That state parties are obliged to ensure that women's decision to terminate pregnancies on, the ground, uh, do, on this ground do not perpetuate stereotypes toward persons of disabilities. And such measures should include the provision of appropriate social and financial support for women who choose to carry such pregnancies to term. So what should we be discussing in significant, is significant increases to funding to enable disabled people rather than trying to broadly restrict, restrict rights for women in Northern Ireland? The Green Party will not support the start of a clawback. The Disabled Women Ireland organisation have also said that social and financial support to disabled, women or disabled people and their parents is the strongest way to deal with concerns for disability rights. Recognising the full extent of dis disabled people's rights from infancy to old age to education, childhood support, personal assistance, that will make meaningful changes to the quality of disabled people's everyday lives. Restrictions on abortion will only place further restrictions on the reproductive rights and freedoms of people with disabilities. The motion and proposed amendment would disproportionately harm disabled women whose pregnancies are diagnosed with a fatal anomaly and contravene the state's obligation under the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And Mr Gildernew, who's already spoke, I'm going to give you a quote of something you said recently. Women in the North must be able to access modern and compassionate health care services that have been legislated for. Sinn Féin welcomes the decriminalisation of women and the legislation of modern health care services for women in the North. This means that women in crises will now have the benefit of local medical services, advice and support. But what your amended amendment to this motion will mean is that women from Northern Ireland will ha still have to travel to access abortion health care. That's not very local in my understanding of it. And Deputy First Minister Michelle O'Neill has also said, 
Sinn Féin opposed the extension of Britain's 1967 Act of the North, but British legislation which criminalises women who have, who have an abortion should be repealed immediately. Well, that's been done. But what your motion today and this amendment will mean is that Sinn Féin may not want British legislation, but they're very happy then to continue to export Irish and Northern Irish women to Britain for health care, which is simple hypocrisy in my book. What happened to the platitudes Would the member draw remarks to close? making decisions about their bodies, their lives and their pregnancies? What happened to the slogans about the North is next? The Green Party will be voting against both this motion and this amendment, and I would urge other members, Sinn Féin included, the members to time do the same. is up. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, first, I would like to say a few words about Heidi Crowder. Heidi really is a remarkable young woman. I get goosebumps when I see her and other young women like her speaking up for what they believe in. Um, I have not met Heidi. Um, I would really like to. Nevertheless, from what I see and hear, her challenges haven't limited her, but rather she takes value from those challenges to enable and strengthen. And we can learn so much from that spirit. Heidi's intervention is important because she represents an informed and experienced voice that is affected by this debate. Like other MLAs, I have received significant correspondence from constituents and others expressing their view on this issue. And I do appreciate the time taken uh, to contact me, not just this past week, um, but also in the time since the legislation was passed at Westminster. I rise not to support this motion nor the amendment for a number of reasons which I hope I have time to outline. I do appreciate the opportunity the proponents of this motion have given this House to discuss this issue. As a devolved region of the United Kingdom with statutory responsibility for health and justice issues, it should have been for members of this House to progress this legislation and subsequent regulations. I sought to do that when I was Minister of Justice in the previous mandate, alongside then Health Minister, in respect of fatal, fatal abnormalities. And I do genuinely believe that that would have happened had the executive not collapsed. At the time, I was criticised for sitting on a report. I did not. I was giving my executive colleagues time to consider it. If they had no intentions of supporting any change, they would have rejected it from the outset, and they did not. I have no doubt that the intention of this motion is an opportunity for the proponents to express and put on record their partisan position regarding abortion generally, subsequent to legislation that was passed in Westminster last year. And I have no difficulty with that. I reiterate my earlier point. This issue should have been debated and progressed in this House. But it did not. It happened at Westminster, where the party who is proposing this debate today had at that time power to stop it happening there. If I am overstating this power, which I don't believe I am, I would really welcome an intervention from the DUP to explain why they didn't try and stop it at that point, especially considering the action they took today and the action in October. Yes, you voted against it, but you had the ear of Downing Street and you could have done much more, but I don't think you did. But please, thank you. I, I appreciate the member giving way. and Let me assure the member at every opportunity the DUP at its highest levels engaged with the Prime Minister uh, not to pursue this course of action. The member will know that this, this is a free vote as it is for other parties and there was an inability to whip Conservative MPs on this issue and the vote was overwhelmingly passed in Parliament. Our MPs, as the member has indicated, voted against that, and we continued to seek to stop what has been happening, as this motion now is part of that ongoing campaign. And I would just ask the member to, ref to, to reflect on that, and I'll make more comments and hope that she can come to a different position than what she's outlined. The member's next extra minute. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I do appreciate that, but I still feel that you had more power to do something more than voting against it and paying, um, I suppose, lip service to the fact that you don't support this motion. Yes, of course. The member needs to uh, understand that this was uh, a free vote in the House of Commons, and actually the majority of Conservative MPs didn't vote in favour of what went through the House. But she will recall at that stage there were quite a considerable number of others in the House. It's not like today where they have a majority uh, position. Uh, and therefore, the House voted in a particular way. It didn't really matter what the Prime Minister had to say in relation to the matter. The, the matter went through the House on an amendment, as she will remember, from the Labour Party. So I think it's very unfair of the member to characterise the fact that this party did not do enough to stop this matter because we have been consistent 
unlike other parties in this House, consistently in favour of pro-life positions. So it's very wrong of the member to do that today. Um, I, I thank the, the leader of the DUP for uh, giving me that side. I, I, I disagree, but th that's obviously something that um, we will have to agree to disagree on. Um, I do, that said, fully respect the varied opinion on this issue, and I do, genuinely do welcome this discussion. I just don't like the choreography, which also extends to the amendment tabled by the other side of this House. It's easy to agree with decisions when you've relinquished responsibility to someone else, but when you're called on it, please be honest. Nonetheless, there are many opinions, and I have taken time to listen to all of those. It is very clear to me that this isn't a simple binary choice of pro-life versus pro-choice. It's not black and white. It is the greyest of greys. Personally, I remain deeply conflicted regarding abortion, and I'm not even sure I entirely agree with the position I am taking. This is a highly emotive issue, and my guide tends to be compassion for everyone involved. Our previous law, our leadership vacuum, could not facilitate compassion for women, their partners, their families and the babies they carried, so the law did need to change. When I initially read the wording of this particular motion, I was inclined to support, to support it because I do have difficulty with these regulations, namely part three, which enables termination up to birth in certain circumstances. And I actually thought this motion was referring to that, but I reread it. And this uh, motion rejects all imposition of abortion legislation, including Down syndrome, but also everything else, the member including remarks the FFA close. And, uh, uh, and other issues. The wording is ambiguous, and not unknowing the proponent's uh, policy position on this, I don't think I can support it. Um, but lastly, I will make a point about the need to raise the issue around pe why people don't feel supported. The member's time uh, is up. Thank the you. member's time is up. I now call Jerry Carl. I have to advise you there are only two minutes in this debate remaining, should you choose to take it. Uh, thanks, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. I mean, it's important that I get a chance to speak, but it's a shame I don't get the same length of time of, uh, as others. Uh, today's debate about abortion has spurned con uh, confusion and outrage, and it isn't difficult to see why. On the one hand, the Supreme Court declared that the kind of restrictions on abortion at the heart of both the DUP's motion and the Sinn Féin Amendment are a breach of human rights. The UN Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights deems such restrictions, and I quote, gender-based violence, unconscionable, inhumane, cruel and tantamount to torture in certain conditions. And when Westminster intervened to decriminalise abortion, the majority of people here welcomed it. On the other hand, the two largest parties have now bandied together to send out a clear message that abortion should be heavily restricted, despite the brutal experiences that it creates for women and pregnant people. There is confusion too around the basis of Sinn Féin's amendment, which seems to totally ignore their own policy on women's health and abortion, and is wholly out of step with the pro-choice rhetoric they used during the repeal referendum. Forcing women to travel for abortion is not pro-choice, nor is it humane. And finally, there is confusion as to why this agenda is being pushed when the evidence shows that around the world where abortion restrictions are lifted, where it is treated like health care rather than a legal issue, the rates of later term abortions actually fall. In Canada, there are no restrictions and no time limits. The rate of abortions after 20 weeks is just 0.6 per cent, three times less than the rate in Britain. Medical professionals, royal colleges, the UN, Amnesty and other rights-based organisations overwhelmingly endorse the removal of barriers to access and abortion as best medical ask the member draws remarks to close. For all those reasons, I rise to oppose this shameful attempt by Sinn Féin and the DUP to restrict uh, reproductive rights, and I will be voting against both uh, the amendment uh, and the motion as a whole. And it's important that we trust women to make decisions that they know is best for them. I now call Pat Sheen to wind on the amendment, and you will have five minutes. Um, I'll, uh, I'll ask Ken Corla. And from the outset, I want to say Sinn Féin will be opposing this DUP motion, which is aimed at denying women access to their reproductive rights. I stand here as a member of the Health Committee to speak about an issue that relates to women's health. And I appreciate that what we are discussing is a very emotive and contentious issue with very strongly held views on, on all sides of the debate. And it's important that respect is shown to all views in this debate. Sinn Féin has a very cl clear view on the issue of abortion, and I want to set out our position so that there is no ambiguity or misunderstanding about where we stand. 
Sinn Féin is an entirely democratic political party, and our policies on all issues are decided at our Ardeshina on an annual basis uh, by our party membership. Our party members clearly expressed the view at our Ardeshina in 2018 that previous legislation on abortion, both North and South, was failing women on this island. It was also incompatible with human rights law. Clearly, there is a mood out in society that is demanding changes on abortion law. That same mood exists within Sinn Féin. And that is not to say that Sinn Féin supports the introduction of the British 1967 Abortion Act here in the North. We don't. Our position is clear and consistent. Sinn Féin supports the introduction of termination of pregnancy only in very clearly defined circumstances. Abortion should be available where a woman's life, health or mental health is at risk, in cases of fatal fetal abnormality, and in cases where pregnancy has occurred as a result of rape, incest or sexual abuse. We do not support abortion on grounds of non-fatal fetal abnormality. Our party policy on that issue is absolutely crystal clear. That is what our party members voted for, and it has nothing to do with populism or opportunism. The motion proposed by the DUP today is a rejection of any legislation that would permit abortion here under any circumstances. Sinn Féin will not support that position, and if our amendment fails, we will vote against the DUP motion. A Kion Korla, no, I'm not giving my. A Kion Korla, abortions have been taking place for many, many years and centuries. Previously, most were back street abortions, uh, with all the attendant health risks and danger for the woman. More recently, women from here have had to make lonely and traumatic journeys across the water to access abortion, often incurring significant financial costs. More importantly, they frequently, frequently had to travel without family support and the emotional solidarity they would have if they could access the same health care here at home. And in this technological age, women and girls have been accessing abortion pills on the internet and taking them without medical supervision. This is an unacceptable situation, but that is where the DUP want to bring us back to. And they are entitled, of course, to do that. However, it is beneath contempt that they have cynically tried to manipulate emotions around Down syndrome children in an attempt to undermine the right of women to modern and compassionate health care and to roll back the progress that we have seen belatedly on this issue. That is why Sinn Féin has brought forward our amendment, and that is why we are totally and absolutely opposed to the DUP motion. I now call on Paul Given to conclude and wind up this debate on the substantive motion. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank all members for uh, taking part in this debate today. I want to thank those that have spoken in support of the motion for the very measured way that they have engaged, the respectful way that they have uh, engaged in this debate. I want to thank members uh, who have indicated concerns, again, for the, the respectful way that they have done that. I think some of the language has been regrettable around cynical exploitation, playing politics. That isn't the case, and, and the attack on Sinn Féin by Claire Bailey and, and Jerry Carroll is something that I think is highly regrettable. Uh, similarly, they use the same language against Sinn Féin that Sinn Féin have used in respect of those that support this motion, and I think that is regrettable. We need to debate this in a very sensitive way, a measured way. On the non-fatal disabilities, Sinn Féin accept that both lives matter. We accept both lives matter in many more circumstances, and it is about supporting both lives. That is vitally important. So I do think it is important that we acknowledge the contributions that people have made, and I want to, to thank them for that. I want to thank the member for East Belfast, Joanne Bunting, for opening the debate and her powerful contribution and that of others. My appreciation to members that have spoken in support of the, the motion, but in particular I want to thank Robbie Butler and Rosemary Barton. I want to thank Patsy McGlone and Dolores Kelly for their support and the approach that they have been taking on this issue in advance of the debate today. This cross-party and cross-community approach is a demonstration of the shared values that we have. This issue is not a DUP issue. It is an issue for all of us. 
and Assembly members today, as in the past, when I worked with people like Pat's, uh, Pat Ramsey, Alban McGuinness, Danny Kennedy, and indeed the late Seamus Close, is something that we had common cause in and worked together on. It's, it is extraordinary that the UK Government should have included a provision in these abortion regulations that is years out of date and would be a regressive step and a backwards step in the campaign against discrimination and equality for people with disabilities. We have had the advent of the Disability Discrimination Act in 1995, the UK signing up to and ratifying the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2009, and yet here we are having a law that invites us to view viable human beings that have non-fatal disabilities as less deserving of the protection of the law than viable human beings of the same age who are not disabled. We are dealing with a law that lays the foundations for fatal discrimination. Discrimination that says that someone's life can be ended because of their disability. Regulation 7.1b and Regulation 13 are quite simply extraordinary and it brings shame on the UK Government and Westminster if it approves it later this month. It is enough to make any person with a non-fatal disability like Heidi Crowder or anyone who is such a person in their family completely devastated. No one can spend time with Heidi or anyone with Down syndrome and feel that that would be acceptable. I had the pleasure, as, as colleagues have said, to speak with Heidi, a remarkable woman who celebrates her birthday on the 4th of July, Independence Day. And there she is, campaigning for her equality of treatment and for freedom for people like her that have the chance of being born with Down syndrome. Her life has been one full of joy and happiness due to get married later this month to James. And when we listen to Heidi speaking of being deeply hurt and offended by this legislation, that she is viewed as less valued as other people, that should make all of us moved with compassion and compelled to take action. Many of us will know people in these circumstances. The family of the oldest member in society in the UK and Ireland, George, celebrated his 76th birthday yesterday. And his family have given support to this motion, saying, we love our wee brother. He has brought us so much love and joy. He has had a great life. My own great uncle, my father's uncle Samuel, had Down syndrome. He lived for, 70, for, <laughs> for 57 years, and he had a love for animals. My father speaks about his tremendous work ethic on the family farm and what joy he brought to that family. I never had the opportunity to meet him. The idea that Down syndrome is some huge problem that should be addressed by abortion is chilling, and it suggests a complete lack of interest in how people with Down syndrome and their families see the world. The problems with Regulation 7 and 13, however, do not just pertain to what they do, but also the way in which they have been developed. The story of these regulations has been, has been one of a litany of constitutional abuses that no self-respecting democracy should ever countenance. The regulations are the result of a vote to change abortion law in Northern Ireland, in which the votes of actual MPs that represent the people of Northern Ireland were silenced by the votes of other MPs, none of whom represent this place. The legislation pushed through via an amendment to an unrelated bill, subject to accelerated procedure, should never have been the case. The original am amendment, tabled and commended by Claire Bailey in the name of Stella Creasy, was so incoherent that rather than being amended, the House of Lords totally rewrote it, and then the entire new provision was sent back to MPs, and they only had 17 minutes' worth of a fragmented debate which took place around Brexit and passed a vote, but not specifically on that amendment from the House of Lords, grouped with wider amendments. I'll give way to Mr Lund. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. Um, he, he could perhaps help me decide what way I intend to vote on the DUP motion. If he would explain to us what is the DUP position here. Is it the intention, which I gathered from Mrs Bunting's excellent speech, to concentrate on the one clause 7.1b and try and get that changed? Or is it what Mrs Cameron appeared to let out of the bag, which is frankly a much wider discussion about the Abortion Act in total? If you could clarify that for me, it would help a lot. I, I will. I'm going to address that point just as, as I conclude. Um, but he, he does raise a valid point, and one that I can understand why he makes. Up until this point, it was Parliament that had treated Northern Ireland badly. But from here on in, 
It has been the Conservative government that have made matters worse. In the first instance, they had a consultation on regulations much shorter than the usual 12 weeks, especially on controversial topics. It lasted six weeks, four of which those days, only four of those days took place outside of a general election campaign. In the second instance, they completely ignored the fact that 79 per cent of respondents said, please don't do this. Then the Secretary of State proceeded to develop regulations in a way that has undermined devolution to a greater extent than Parliament actually required. That point has been spelt out in a legal opinion by one of our leading constitutional lawyers, David Schofield QC. It would have been bad enough for the Secretary of State to compound the undermining of devolution in a context where the Assembly was suspended, but has continued with that approach even after the restoration of devolution. And if that isn't bad enough, the body charged by the UK Parliament for checking these regulations uniquely had no representation from Northern Ireland. That meant that the regulations, which only relate to Northern Ireland, were checked by a UK Parliament body consisting of English, Welsh and Scottish parliamentarians. And there's also other concerns in respect of these regulations. Regulation 4 provides access to abortion to 24 weeks on the same basis as GB. And Dolores Kelly outlined concerns in respect of that aspect, and I don't intend uh, to, to repeat them. The way in which the abortion regulations have been developed by the UK Parliament and the UK Government have treated Northern Ireland with contempt. No member of this Assembly would tolerate the Executive or an Executive Minister acting in this way. In this context, it does not seem appropriate for this Assembly to go out of its way to infer that it is prepared to accept other aspects of these regulations beyond Regulation 7 and 13 when the manner of their development as a whole has involved meeting out to Northern Ireland such a litany of constitutional abuses. If I, if I have, I'll, I'll give way briefly, um, Christopher. Give him way. I ask sincerely, do, does the member take any responsibility for the passage of this legislation being as a result of failed leadership in Northern Ireland? Well, l let me just deal with that point. We are where we are today. Clear me at this point. We can go over what happened in the past. Members are asked to deal with the circumstances today. Viewing this through a prism of wanting to be politically critical of a party and its approach in the past, if, uh, whether it's right or not, does a disservice to what you're being asked to consider today. And I know that there are members that have wrestled with how they should vote on this matter. I understand the sincere considerations that you have in terms of giving your support to this motion. Today is not about me. It's not about my party. The issue is much too important for that. And I know not everyone will agree with my position, and I may not agree with your position. But we should all agree that as elected representatives of the people, we take responsibility for reflecting the values of our society here in this Assembly and seek to reach common ground. I appeal, member to members, to close? I appeal to members, if you can't listen to me, hear the voice of Heidi Crowder and people like her. I ask members to support the motion as originally tabled. Members, the question is the amendment standing in the names of Emma Sheeran, Kiva Archibald, Colin Gilton New and Pat Sheedon be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary no. Aye. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes and I would remind members that you should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting uh, arrangements in place should not come into the chamber. Order members, order. Would members resume their seat? The question is that the amendment in the name of Emma Sheeran, Kiva Archibald, Colin Gildenew and Pat Sheehan be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. Do we have tellers? Order members, the following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the ayes, Kiva Archibald and Emma Sheeran. Tellers for the noes, Joanne Bunting and Rosemary Barton. Before this, I'm advised to remind, remind you that on a standing order 112,
The Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. It is important that during any division, social distancing in the Chamber continues to be observed. And in order to facilitate this, I would ask the following. Any member in the Chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the Chamber until the division has uh, concluded. And those members who wish to vote in lobbies on the opposite side of the Chamber to which they are sitting should leave the Chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until the division has uh, concluded. However, any member who needs to vote in both lobbies should not leave the chamber. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times, to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks, and to respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies, the House will divide, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order, would members resume their seats? Clerk, please read the motion. 84 members voted, 32 members voted aye, 52 members voted no. Three members who voted in both lobbies are not included in these results. The amendment therefore falls. The amendment falls. The amendment falls. Unfasten the doors. Uh, and I wish to allow members a few moments uh, in case they need to come back into the chamber. So we'll just pause for a moment. The question now is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Clear the lobby. The question will be put again in three minutes. Order members. The question is that the motion standing in the order paper in the names of Paul Gibbon, Joanne Bunting, Michelle McElveen and Pam Cameron be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. Do we have tellers? Order members, the following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the ayes, Joanne Bunting and Rosemary Barton. Tellers for the noes, Kiva Archibald and Emma Sheeran. I would ask members to once again respect social distancing during voting. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order members. Clark, will you please read the result. 86 members voted. 46 members voted aye. 40 members voted no. One member who voted in both lobbies is not included in these results. The motion is carried. The motion is carried. The motion is carried.